Welcome to Millennial 643. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. We're all sporting our Millennial Greetings from 2020 t-shirts. God is real because we all got these shirts today, <laughs> just in time for recording. And I think that a bunch of other- That was the test. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that we was were the like, test. We need to know. Now I'm convinced. That's actually, like, I'm impressed it got to you, Laura, because you're in Georgia, but the company right. that we use is in, in the East Bay- or yeah, in the in South Bay for me. So it's like just down the street, basically. Yeah. But it's funny to me, like they can deliver the millennial t-shirts, no problem, very quick, countrywide, but ballots, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Okay, there's like millions of ballots and only like 250 millennial t-shirts, but still, but still. It's not that far off. These t-shirts went out to our Bay level patrons. We turned them around really quick. Thank you again to Tawny who designed the shirt for us. And then uh, thank you to our t-shirt printer and shipper who handled everything. And we were like, we got to turn these around quick. Everybody needs their 2020 t-shirt before 2020 ends. And they did it. So uh, we're really happy with them. And we'll definitely work with them again in the future. Brand Marinade is their name. If you're looking for a good printer, just let them know that we sent you. We would appreciate and we that. would also, you know, as you're getting your shirts in the mail, we would love to see pictures of them. So take a picture with your uh, your greetings from 2020 shirt and put it on social and we can come up with a hashtag. Maybe, Andrew, like millennial shirt or millennial 2020. <laughs> <laughs> We're making these decisions on the fly. How about this greetings is... from 2020? Millennial greetings... shirt is such a boring ha- hashtag. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> OK, greetings from 2020. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, of course, to our Bay patrons who support us. We're really happy to offer benefits like this. We offer a new physical gift once a year. Last year was the letter. The year before that was the stickers. The year before that may have been um, posters. Shirts? Posters. That's right. We did posters. Yeah. Yeah. I never got that poster. Yes, you but did. I, honest to God, I never got a poster. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I'm sure I did at some point. Maybe. Okay. I was like, I definitely sent you one. Send me a picture of the poster. <laughs> I've got extra copies. Okay, I'll take one. I'll take yeah, one. Yeah, I'll send yeah. you one. I'll put it on this wall behind me. I mean, it's our old branding, so I don't know oh. how you feel about that. No, that's not, fine. It's not this lovely cobalt blue that is that's now <laughs> the official millennial branding. Well, Y'all re- m- might remember that last week we made a prank call to Donald Trump's voter su- voter suppression hotline, his voter fraud hotline, um, where they were basically asking people to call in for examples of voter fraud that they've seen at their polling places. We called and let them know about a couple of very serious examples of voter fraud that we had witnessed. Yes. And it turns mm-hmm. out they were getting so many calls like the ones we made last week that they shut mm-hmm. it down. So it's Aww, gone man. now. You know, if you wanted to make a call, but you didn't get a chance, you've missed the boat. I'm so sorry. Darn. That (laughs) was so fun. Hashtag rip. Gone in a flash. But apparently they're going to launch a new site where you can report fraud. Allegedly. They're they're allegedly saying that they're going to put up a site where you can submit. I haven't found it yet. I think they're just going to let that one die quietly in the night. The same thing is going to (laughs) happen. It's going to get trolled to shit again. People like us are going to go on there and write the, I'm, I'm gonna copy and paste never sever us into the contact us form and it's just gonna <laughs> they should be so lucky <laughs> and my p story that i released on patreon <laughs> i'll just find all of these wonderful tiktoks that have been put up about Lindsey graham and just paste the links to them in the submission form. <laughs> little entertainment item i wanted to mention this because i saw it last week and i was intrigued Wonder Woman 1984, that's the big sequel that was supposed to be released this past summer. It's currently scheduled for theatrical release over Christmas. Now it may be released on HBO Max in December. And the reason I wanted to talk about this this week is because apparently by today, Monday, they were supposed to have made a decision on if they were going to release it on HBO Max or not. So they're debating either releasing it in theaters next month as scheduled and just leave it in theaters. Or put it in theaters, but then quickly add it to HBO Max, or just push it till next year. I feel like they should just drop it on HBO Max. Give it to everybody, because we don't know, even though there is good vaccine news again this week, we don't know how long it's going to be until everybody can get that vaccine and is comfortable going to the theater again. Um, And if they did release it on HBO Max this December, it would be a very big deal. 
because it would be the biggest movie, I think, to release on streaming during the pandemic yet. What do you think, Pam? Yeah, I mean, like, imagine Wonder Woman 1984 going head to head with Soul on Christmas Day over at Disney Plus. Oh, yeah. That would be fantastic. Um, That's something for everybody. But I think that you're right. That would definitely be the biggest release to hit streaming due to the current pandemic and also probably the first big loss because those movie theaters are really looking for these huge blockbuster hits to really bring the business back in. But, you know, I, I just don't know. I understand why they would prefer studios wait. I just don't see how it's possible because there's no way for studios to know when, you know, things are going to be allowed to open up or like people will be comfortable going back to theaters, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the slates are just getting pushed back like more and more and more, but movies are still being made. You know, most studios are back in action. So it's like, at what point do you just bank everything and then run the risk of having the technology already look dated because things are being updated constantly yeah you know good point yeah. the reviews uh on soul pixar soul are very very good from what i've seen so far so that is going to be one you do not want to miss when disney releases it for free on disney plus by the way i also saw during their latest earnings earnings call late last week that they are planning on doing more uh, premium releases on Disney Plus like they did with Mulan. So we'll see what movies they select. Maybe it'll be Black Widow. Maybe it'll be something we don't know exists yet. But um, yeah, they're going to continue charging us another $30 for early big theatrical releases on Disney Plus. No surprise there. Remember when they said it would just be Mulan and that's it? Yeah. Like, oh, we're just doing we this knew. once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Liars. Also, Black Friday is coming up. I wanted to bring this up because I noticed that a lot of retailers are already starting their Black Friday sales, I guess, to avoid the big crowds on Black Friday itself. And because maybe people are less comfortable going out on Black Friday this year. I don't know. Have you guys noticed these two? Like Walmart is doing deals for days and Target is doing Black Friday now, but I don't think they're very exciting deals. They're just like normal weekly deals to me. So Black Friday is a flop this year, in my opinion. But like, how often are there really, like, I feel like every year on Black Friday, I get dragged to the store, you By know, who? on the pretense of finding you? details. Like the family, they're like, let's go shopping together because family time and I get voted <laughs> out. So I have to go to the stores and they're always touting these great deals. And it's like, there's nothing there that I couldn't find on sale sometime throughout the year you know yeah it's like i don't I need more dvds right. target like tempting but no <laughs> like you know i don't need a computer but i guess if you do it makes sense to queue up yeah I just never enjoyed black friday i don't participate in it every year on the show this question comes up and i'm always the person that's like bah humbug fuck black friday so yeah i, I haven't really been paying attention to any of these deals but i feel like Cyber Monday is where it's at. And if I do buy anything related to sort of like Black Friday weekend sales, it's the Cyber Monday sales because everything I buy is on the internet anyway. I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah. And that was true pre pandemic. Like I didn't want to shop before the pandemic. So I don't feel like I'm losing anything here. But I understand for people, this was a ritual. I know some people enjoyed doing the Thanksgiving thing and then they would go out. Especially for I some enjoy of those. that. Yeah, and that that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. It's I a just, little sad. But... I just I personally am not big into it. But like I know for people, they would get together with their family after Thanksgiving dinner because some stores were opening up on Thanksgiving as opposed to waiting until Friday, which I think is criminal to do to your employees. But yeah, a lot of people really enjoyed it. And I understand that for folks, that means it's another tradition that's being lost this year. So I, I get why it's tricky to try and replicate and that, also, you know? gift giving is going to be different this year because, for example, like I brought up last week, I'm not going home for Christmas for the first time in my life. And so I'm guessing that what's going to happen is I'll order gifts for my family, have those just shipped directly to them, and then they'll open them up on Christmas. And I guess we'll, quote unquote, exchange gifts over Zoom, which honestly is just like... 
sounds exhausting to me. It sounds so tacky to me to sit there with a gift. For, you know, keep it in the camera frame. Open it. Oh, nice. Thanks, guys. I don't know. I'm just... So I'm I th- I'm thinking I'll tell my parents, like, let's just maybe... Like, I only ever get them each one gift, and then they give me lots of gifts because I'm the child and the spoiled brat. Um, but this year, I might just be like, just send me one or two things, and then we'll... Do it over Zoom because I know my mom's going to want to see me opening the gifts. Yeah, we've decided as a family to not necessarily nix gifts altogether, but really scale back on it. Um, My parents, they're like ever since we were kids, they just always love it when like there's a load of presents under the tree and they love for everybody to have a lot of stuff to open. And we just had a conversation as a family where we were like, we just don't think that's appropriate this year. Like everybody is feeling this pandemic in one way or another. Some people are feeling it economically and that's a lot of pressure. And we don't want anyone to feel like they need to go out and spend what they would regularly budget for Christmas in the middle of this. So we decided we're putting more emphasis on the celebration of the holiday and the togetherness of it and just having a really nice time to sit around and (laughs) probably get drunk together, honestly, which is what we do anyway and the most fun part of the day anyway. So I think by taking the emphasis off gifts, it just creates a lot less pressure for people. Mm -hmm. And you're celebrating having made it through the year. (laughs) Are you celebrating Christmas? (laughs) That's a huge win. (laughs) Happy birthday, Jesus. But also I survived. (laughs) I'm in the same boat that you guys are in. But again, as with Black Friday, I just feel I don't want to be the humbug that tells people that we shouldn't do it. You know? Yeah. Like I I just got the the family text on Sunday yesterday saying, oh, I know we're not going to be able to be together because of the pandemic, but like, let's still do the family secret Santa. And it's like when everybody is saying yes, except for you, you feel pressured to say yes. Yeah. But like, all I can think about is firstly, the fact that it's going to be super lame to try and get everybody, including grandma and grandpa on Zoom when they can't even do technology. So yeah, you're going to be looking at their nose the whole time. Yeah. And then (laughs) And then everybody's going to be shopping on Amazon because, you know, that's the safest thing to do. But that takes away, like, I don't know, the excitement of the situation. No, I agree. And and then also, here's the other thing. I don't know if I I told you guys this. My brother wants us, me and my mom, to go up for Christmas to Portland. But she has not told the rest of the family that we're leaving. But she's you know, telling us to sign up for the secret Santa. It's like, well, mom, when are you going to tell everybody that we're like skedaddling? (laughs) Because we can't just have like Amazon packages chilling on the front porch when we're not even going to maybe be here. So that's just like a whole other thing. And I just, I'm kind of with you. I kind of just want to like hole up and not do Christmas at all this year, (laughs) which sounds so lame, but it's it's just like, it feels like, mm, but like we spoke about last week, you can, Make the holiday special in your own way. Spend the whole day watching your favorite Christmas movies. Bake all the cookies. However cook- how many cookies you've baked in previous years, triple it. So many You know, just cookies. go all out in ways <laughs> like that. You know, good holiday cocktails. I would not mind doing that. It's just, you know, like, again, that, that I think that everybody's just trying too hard, too hard to make it happen. Yeah. And, and we should just be realistic. I mentioned last week that Pat's planning on going home to Wisconsin for Christmas. He is now planning on not going home for Christmas. Maybe I scared Aww. him off after uh, bringing it up uh, last week. But he just you know, doesn't now, want you to be alone. No, that's not it. He Are doesn't sure? want to kill his grandparents. No, okay, that well, is that's absolutely fair. not. I mean, I'm sure that's a factor, but that's not the deciding factor. So now we're thinking about what to do over Christmas, and we probably will go somewhere that we can drive to. And uh, I'm thinking maybe Christmas in California. That's always had a nice ring to it. When I would I would try to talk my parents into flying out there to visit me, uh, I was like I would always say to them, "Doesn't Christmas in California have a nice ring to it? This can be the year you come and actually visit me for Christmas." So maybe we'll go to the desert out in California or something like that. Uh, by the way, Morgan in the Discord said Joe winning was the only gift I needed this year. That's the thing. That's why we don't need gifts this year. We're all so fulfilled (laughs) in other ways. 
You know, it this gets me thinking maybe we should reimagine the way we do the millennial secret Santa this year in honor of the fact that gift giving is going to look a little different for a lot of people this year. So maybe well, we need we to put our heads together curve, and get creative. Right? Oh, that's true. <laughs> well, wait, we're I already thought, exchanging gifts over Zoom. <laughs> I thought one idea was we buy each other a cameo. Oh, yeah, we can oh, still do yeah, that. Oh, yeah, that's right, because you can that get cheap fun. cameos. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not and, saying but, that I'm going to buy you the cheapest cameo I can find, Andrew, <laughs> but like... Well, the trick is to find somebody who like we know, but who is still cheap and would be hilarious and get them to say things that are hilarious. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, for yeah the I, I think that's a good idea. That's yeah. different. Yeah. $10 limit. Is that $10 limit? <laughs> $10 no, that limit. might be too hard. <laughs> find that the shittiest cameo ever. Laura doesn't want to get a Sean Spicer cameo <laughs> on Christmas <laughs> I don't know how much he's charging, but I'm guessing it's more than our $25 limit. Probably. <laughs> okay, so we have a new segment here on the show called Tragic Female Singer Contract Updates. <laughs> We're not using that sound effect anymore for Trump Survivor, so I have to repurpose it for right. something else. Gotta get your $1,000 worth. <laughs> so Britney Spears lost her bid to remove her father as her conservator, and Britney's lawyer says she will not perform again as long as her father is in charge of her career. It's a really sad situation. Brittany, I think, pretty clearly wants to be freed of the situation. Her father controls her career, and it seems like her life as well. I mean, I remember when we talked about this before, remind me, Pam, if I'm wrong, but they were struggling to try and get her sister to become her conservator. Yeah, she had, um, I guess, volunteered. So yeah, that was an option that was on the table. I don't know if like her lawyer or Brittany ever spoke about it, but I, I know that that she did. It just um, seems like, herself. you know, it, as long as it was going to stay in the family as it were. Like, I don't understand why her father would be so difficult about this. I mean, apart from just taking advantage of a situation, which is unfortunate. I think he wants to, to keep a about... tight rein on her. Yeah. And I think he doesn't trust her mentally because that's where a lot of this started from. And then also Taylor Swift's catalog has once again been sold, but not to Taylor. And this just broke today. We actually spoke about this maybe about a year year ago when uh, Scooter Braun, the mega producer, bought Taylor Swift's music. It was without her permission. It happened behind her back. It was a very sketchy situation. Pam, what were the developments today? The big news is that Scooter Braun has sold the Taylor Swift Masters. This is everything through her album Reputation. That's what uh, Big Machine owns. So the first and six so albums. Right, the first six albums, and they did not explicitly say who had bought these. It was just um, like reported that it was a private investment group that had purchased the masters for just north of three hundred million dollars, which is pretty interesting because that's what Scooter's Ithaca Group paid to buy Big Machine and also all of the masters that came along with it. Um, so this is a huge blow to Taylor Swift, who's been trying to get ownership of her masters for quite a long time. It also comes at a really interesting month because for those of you that have been following this news, you'll likely recall that November of this year was when she could legally start re-recording any music from her first five albums. So the fact that this is breaking in November and November is when she could have started doing that is kind of, uh, it's adding salt to open wounds, basically. Yeah. She did say she started recording her six albums again, and she said there's going to be a couple of surprises in there. So that's interesting. I guess some collabs. I can't wait to hear those new versions of these albums because you're going to see this matured Taylor. You're going to see somebody who is revisiting all of her music and potentially putting different spins on these. By the way, I meant to bring this up after our last discussion about this. Did you notice that now when you play Taylor Swift's music on like Spotify the album art is within other the album big art. Machine. Yeah. Big machine. Yeah. It's <laughs> mm -hmm. so tacky. <laughs> it is really tacky. They also tried to re like, they made it sound like it was a new re-release of like some live versions of her songs, but it was really just a repackaged re-release that they were selling. This was um, a few months back. Okay. 
that was a thing that had happened. Was there something else in that statement that jumped out to you, Pam? Are you um, geeking out over the fact that she is recording her first six albums? No, I now? mean, like, I think that that w- was exciting even when she announced it in um, August of last year, because, you know, it's like, like you said, it's a whole new ball game potentially. But um, I, I also thought it was really interesting that she mentions that Scooter and his team wanted her to sign an NDA saying that she could buy her masters on the condition that she would never say another bad word about him. Yeah. But that wow. they ne- never quoted her a price. <laughs> like Insane. So she, yeah, infers that that they just kind of, to save face, offered her the opportunity, but it was never really a deal that was going to go through. Right, right. Well, anyway, before we talk about a new feature coming to Netflix, this week's episode of Millennial is sponsored by Hemp Bombs. Hemp Bombs create every type of CBD product imaginable. You have the tinctures, the hand and body lotion, the gummies, the lip balm, the pain freezers, the dog treats, and a whole lot more. All of us here on the panel use CBD for reasons including managing anxiety as well as joint and muscle pain. It's a safe and effective way to aid some problems in our lives. What makes Hemp Bomb stand out is that they make a range of excellent CBD products at great prices. Plus, Hemp Bombs are the only CBD company that manages their entire supply chain from seed to sale. So you can rest easy knowing that these products were made safely. And recently, they introduced a subscription and rewards program. You can sign up for a subscription of your favorite product to be automatically ordered and delivered to your door monthly and save 20%. This is very helpful because once you start taking CBD, you're taking it on a regular basis, usually daily. So you're going to inevitably run out of the supply on hand. But with a Hemp Bombs subscription, they'll automatically remember to send you the goods when you're running low, and you'll save a little bit of money along the way. And we've got a great discount for you on their products. Use code MILL Radio for 30% off your Hemp Bombs order. Again, the code is MILL Radio for 30% off your order. And once you move to the billing page, you will see the discount was applied. So, Pam, Netflix announced a new feature that they're testing. Yeah, so this is actually pretty interesting because it would actually find Netflix taking some cues from traditional television. So currently they're testing a new feature called Direct, which is a brand new linear channel and it's set up like a traditional network. So it's comprised of real-time scheduled programming that's curated by Netflix and it's going to be featuring a variety of films and series that are available on the platform currently. It's only testing in France right now. Uh, France has about 9 million total subscribers, but if rolled out en masse, then Netflix says it would be available to subscribers only. So it seems as though it's not going to be, you know, like a channel you can add to a traditional cable plan, for example. The streamer said that it chose France to test direct out in because of their consumption of traditional TV. Um, And then they also said in that same statement that the reason that they're trying this out is because a lot of viewers like the idea of programming that doesn't require them to choose what they're going to watch. And they think that it'll be helpful for subscribers, whether that means that they're lacking inspiration or just discovering Netflix for the first time or, you know, just want somebody to recommend them stuff instead of having to flip through all of the different tabs. So this like is we kind were of stressing out about yeah. last week. There's I know it's options. That's so funny. It's almost like they listened to Millennial and they were like, you know what? We're going <laughs> to give you guys what you want. What do you guys think about this? I mean, is this something that you would be interested in? I know Andrew's happy. No, I'm not yeah. happy. I think no? this is the wrong tree to bark up. Look, if well, okay, it's different if they are premiering a television episode or series at the same time around the globe and we can all watch it in sync. I've proposed this idea on the show before. Let's say for the new season of Stranger Things, whenever that premieres, we all get to tune in at 9 p.m. Eastern. We all get to watch. We all get to live tweet. We all get to experience a new season together. That is cool because. That, you know, if if we're all watching at different times, it's hard to tweet about the show other than be like, wow, that was amazing. That's what I want. I don't want this direct feature where they're airing stuff and what are they going to do? Just air random episodes? I don't I don't really get it. Yeah. So that, that's my whole qualm with this, too. I think the idea in theory makes sense. I just don't know how they're going to do this because I assume that they would want to um, focus on airing popular programming. 
Mm -hmm. you know, because that's what's going to suck people in. But a lot of those shows aren't procedural. So you need the backstory to figure out what's going on. Right. Like imagine tuning into like, I don't know, episode six of Stranger Things season one, and you have no context of any of the characters or why you should care or what's going on. Right. Or if you're a really big fan of one of these shows, you're going to watch it probably as soon as it premieres. You're not going to wait to watch it during direct unless it is premiering on direct. Yeah, I guess I initially thought when I heard of this, I thought that that would be what they would do. Like, obviously, they're going to play their older stuff and sort of cycle it through on direct. But that maybe for big name releases, they might do those on direct and they might not do it for like every episode of the new stranger things but maybe the first one or something like Mm -hmm. that just to give people something to be hype about but if that's not what they're doing then yeah i would have to say i wouldn't really see myself using this on the other hand i do like flipping through television just to see what's on so i guess it's for people like that i'm sure there will there will be an audience for this because netflix is so large like i said they can throw anything at the wall even if it's total shit they're gonna get a pretty sizable audience to watch it just because of how big they are i'd rather see them add premieres we all get to watch at the same time and switch to weekly episode releases i'm done with binging do it the disney plus way that works because if you release all the episodes at once People are tweeting about it for a weekend, and then that's it. Whereas with Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, we're tweeting about it for eight weeks straight. It is kind of anxiety-inducing, too. Like, for example, I completely forgot that The Crown um, premiered already. And it's like, I already feel behind because everybody I know has already binged through it. So. (laughs) So I have not watched the first three seasons of The Crown. However, I did tune in for the season four premiere because this is the season with Princess Diana, and I am intrigued. You must be a huge fan of this show, Pam. I was thinking about that while watching this. I don't know when I got the reputation for being like obsessed with royals, but it's Because you want to talk I'm about the royals all the time. That's why. You're like, <laughs> guys, there's a royal wedding happening. I don't remember doing that, but yes, I'll go you for did. it. I'll go with did it. She? That's fine. Yes. Did I? Yes. Anyway, I know that Laura is excited for the crown anyway. So yeah. she and I can just talk about this over here and you can. <laughs> exactly. And Andrew, actually, there. I really think you should go back and watch it um, because I'm really I'm not super obsessed with the royals. Like I've never really been interested in their goings on or watching the royal weddings or anything. But this show is a very interesting dramatization of real history. Mm. And there's like so much like i mean apart from like literal tea because they're british but like there's just a ton of like (laughs) tea and like just juicy shit that happens and you're like oh my god these people are i don't know they have a dysfunctional family just like the rest of us (laughs) royals they're just like us yeah exactly also you're a big uh down to nappy fan i am i feel like it would be right up your street yeah you would feel like like you know classic excuse i tried one episode i was like meh and then then i didn't continue but yeah maybe i'll give it another shot from the start okay it's time for our new segment jomentum 2021 Isn't this delightful? I, I feel like I'm watching a Disney fireworks display. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank 100%. you. I was like, yeah. I feel like yeah. I'm in like the opening sequence of a Disney animated feature. Right, exactly. I'm just so happy I could listen to it all day. <laughs> There's two more oh minutes. We'll be right back. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So overall, Biden and Harris are up 5.6 million votes. In the popular vote and counting as of Monday morning. That's kind of fun to see. Also, two more states have been projected. First of all, Biden has won Arizona. This is a big flip from 2016. Trump took it four years ago. It's the first time a Democrat has won the state since 1996. And it's also a sign of the changing demographics out West. The West was not always blue. California, uh, Seattle, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. I'd never remember. Pam. Oregon, I think. Oregon. 
Unless it it's like Nevada where they get really upset if you say it wrong. Yeah. I, I fixed myself on that one really quick. <laughs> I used to be a Nevada person, but it's Nevada. It's Nevada, right? Yeah. yeah. It was funny. During the election, everyone in my household kept calling it Nevada. And now <laughs> that I've gotten so used to saying Nevada, it's like hearing glass break. <laughs> every time and i'm did you try I, correcting them no because i don't want to be that person who's like actually because i'm not even from nevada so i don't feel like i have the right to do it but. well you could be like andrew lives there that, that can be well your dad listens so mr yeah. t it's nevada <laughs> nevada correct your wife <laughs> and your son if you ever hear them saying it that way or mark <laughs> your future son-in-law um so the west used to be it wasn't always reliably blue but now the west coast is and now we're seeing Arizona go blue it might be a sign of the changing tides there as well so that's pretty cool to see. And then what was the other state that was called Laura? Georgia. Last week. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> Sorry. I mean last week the numbers were pretty clear. Um, But over the weekend, Georgia was officially called. The way that I knew this was real, honestly, was I saw it on, like, I got a CNN breaking news alert showing that Georgia had been called. And I was like, okay, CNN never makes projections before anyone else. (laughs) So if they're saying it, it's got to be true. They're so gun shy about declaring anything after what happened to them in 2000, like ever since then. Every other network will make a projection and CNN will be like, we're still counting the votes. I will say they were the first to call the presidency, though. You were sleeping, yes. so you didn't realize it. But they were the first to call the presidency. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the, the electoral math worked in their favor, I suppose. But like in terms of calling actual states, Got they, it. Take, okay. they take a long time. Um, but this was really exciting. Um, in the T household, we definitely took some shots <laughs> it's like it was like election it was like winning the election part two basically yeah i bet um but this was another state that was really meaningful because the last time georgia went blue was in 1992 for bill clinton um. so also been a while um and we definitely have to celebrate and we have to be so happy that you know we like as a state we've really progressed to a point where we we're in play when it comes to an election. We matter. And that's really wonderful and affirming because for a long time, we've known that Georgia is incredibly diverse and has a population that overall would benefit from progressive policies. But we have been under the thumb of voter suppression for so long that it's taken us forever to get here again. And it feels really, really good to be here. But we cannot get complacent. And we must remember that the January 5th runoff that we're having here is going to determine how much we'll be able to accomplish under a Biden presidency. Remember, if we don't want Joe Biden to have to lead through executive order, we need to deliver the Senate. And the way we deliver the Senate is by getting John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock elected here on January 5th. Um, Reminder to Georgians, you have until December 7th to register if you haven't already. If you're not 18 yet, but will be 18 by January the 5th, you can register. So please do that by December 7th. And I know a lot of people from out of state are looking to volunteer for these campaigns. And that's great. But I just want to give everyone a life pro tip. Um, If you are out of state and volunteering to make calls for the Warnock or Ossoff campaigns, make a Google voice number with a Georgia area code to call from. (laughs) Like, one, people are more likely to answer local numbers. But two, there's... I think a lot of, there's nothing that turns people off more than when they're getting phone calls from out of state about their election. So don't like call from a California number <laughs> to mm, Georgia voters. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the most prominent area codes you can choose from are 404, 770, 678, and 470. So use one of those or Google it um, and then make yourself a Google voice number. It takes two seconds. Super easy to do. And then also, side note, um, especially if you're a Republican, because apparently the Republican Party is just bad at the Internet right now. Um, (laughs) They need classes or something. Please be sure to buy up all the domains related to your name or else somebody's going to buy them from you and troll the shit out of you. 
This happened to Senator David Perdue and Senator Kelly Loeffler, who are the Republican incumbents running in this runoff. And these sites, one is SenatorDavidPerdue.com. <laughs> you load it up. And it says, I'm David Perdue, racist, anti-Semitic, insider trader. <laughs> and then it has like professionalism, my knowledge level and everything. And then it has like being racist, 100%. <laughs> Empathy, 0.5%. Yeah. Needs of Georgia, not available. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Kelly Loeffler is, is very, very similar, like devout Trump sycophant conspiracy theorist when she loses <laughs> foe of the transgender community. And that's LoefflerSenate.com. That's a domain they definitely should have purchased. Yeah. These are pretty simple domains yeah. you would think to buy. Exactly. Um, and I love how both of these also link to a dating site called MAGALove.com. <laughs> <laughs> and then also of note, sorry, this is a very Georgia heavy little segment here. Um, but the Washington Post came out with a really disturbing article uh, in the last couple of days. Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger has been receiving death threats like to his personal cell phone. Um uh, over the ongoing recount that's happening here in Georgia. One example was he literally got a text message being like, don't bungle this recount. Your life depends on it. Ooh. Um, he's also been receiving um, pressure from prominent Republicans, including Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, to basically cheat in the recount. Lindsey Graham was asking Raffensperger if there was a way to throw out legal ballots that had signature issues that were cured. Wow. So yeah, they're literally trying. They, they've spent the last couple of weeks going on and on about how only legal votes can be counted. And now that that's not working for them, they're like, well, let's find a way to not count some of the legal votes. The Republicans are cheating even though they've been accusing Democrats of cheating. Yes. Got it. And also of note, Brad Raffensperger is a Republican. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're like accusing him of colluding with Stacey Abrams and the Democrats to throw the election in Biden's favor. Brad Raffensperger has been on record being like, I've been a Republican my whole life. I only ever vote Republican. I don't know what these people are talking about. I would never I would never have voted for him. But I appreciate that he's taking his job seriously. And yeah. even though it's probably not the outcome he's desired, I appreciate the fact that he's saying, like, listen, we have to have some level of accountability here. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, it's another example of the current Republican Party wanting to eat its young when they no longer serve the party purpose yeah meanwhile trump is losing the shit out of all his court cases basically lawyers are dropping out lawyers are changing uh judges are laughing these cases out of court it's just a total joke uh on friday for example in philadelphia he was zero for five in those lawsuits in that city so none of that is going well but trump is still tweeting that he won the election he's just resorted to literally tweeting in all caps i won the election I won. <laughs> like I don't I don't get the plan here. It doesn't make sense to me. Maybe he's hoping that if he says it enough times it'll actually come true. Yeah, well, how good are luck you with that. Manifesting. I love how he thinks he can claim things. <laughs> like, I hereby claim for <laughs> electoral purposes. It's like the same energy of a child that will run up to something and lick it and be like, <laughs> "This is mine." <laughs> this is mine now. Yeah, like <laughs> Ariana Grande looking that cupcake in the bakery, although she put it back. Anyway, Gross. also, Biden is floating the idea of forgiving $50,000 of student loan debt per person. That's a pretty big deal by executive order. He's he's not actually floating it himself, but this has actually been coming from Chuck Schumer, who's been very sort of like making heavy suggestions about the types of things that Biden could do via executive order. And just the way he's talking about this and the chatter that's coming out of Washington about it, I don't think that prominent figures like this would be saying those things if it wasn't a distinct possibility. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I thought, though, that, 
you know, we could talk for for those of us who have student debt just briefly. What would this mean to us? Like if on January 21st, President Biden steps in and he signs an executive order clearing $50,000 of student debt away, what does that mean for us? Like for me, it would be pretty life changing. It wouldn't get rid of all my debt, but it would get rid of a good chunk of it and really make my monthly you know, bills, that burden a lot easier to deal with and allow me to start saving money for other things, <laughs> other things that I need, other things that I want to do with my life, you know? Yeah, I I agree with you. I think that it would <laughs> it would feel less like I was dragging around, you know, this dead weight that it, it's like, I don't think that people, unless you have student loans, you don't realize how much it can hold you back from making decisions, you know, like everything that I do is affected by um, student loans. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, oh, if I, if I get like a job offer, it's like, okay, can I, like, if I were to get a job offer in another state, it would be like, oh, can I afford to move there, you know, with my student loan Mm. debt, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's little things like, If you ever go to buy a house, if you go to buy a car, like if you're ever thinking about financing something significant like that, your student loans impact how much you can qualify for. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. if you're trying to make a big move somewhere, like say across the country or something, that's a really expensive undertaking. If you're moving to a really expensive city, you have to take into account how many hundreds of dollars you're paying per month in student loans. And how feasible that's going to be when you move to said big new city. I know for a lot of people, like getting married and having kids is a big consideration. Um, Because not Mm -hmm. only do you want to make sure that you're in a comfortable financial position to raise your child, but there are certain consequences for having student loans and getting married. I mean, there are for most of the um, like loan programs that you can sign up for. There's always an amount of forgiveness that's associated with them after the 20 to 25 year repayment period. But if you get married when you're on one of those forgiveness plans, your spouse's income automatically counts as your income and your monthly loan payment is increased to match that. So it's basically putting your spouse on the hook for the education you chose to get. So there are just, I think, a lot of things that really affect this generation in particular because we're so student debt heavy that this would be a game changer for if it were real. I know in the past Biden has talked about doing 10000 of student debt relief, and that's still like his public facing policy that he has proposed. But the chatter that's coming out of folks like uh, Chuck Schumer makes me think that we could be looking at something a little more generous, fingers crossed. In some lighter news, Barack Obama's A Promised Land is going to be published today, November 17th. I actually pre-ordered it. I'm pretty excited for this because it's going to cover, I think, at least the first half of his eight-year term in the White House. And it, it seems, you know, the reviews I've read so far are are very good. I've read that it's kind of a light read in some ways. So I'm really looking forward to this. Did you guys pre-order by chance? Heck yeah. Get <laughs> I don't the know audiobook. why I pre-ordered. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. He's going to read to you. Mm-hmm. Nice. I did not pre-order, but I'm also excited for the audiobook. I'm just excited for those soothing tones. Like anytime yeah. something stressful happens as Trump continues to try and not transition <laughs> to the next administration. I can just put my AirPods in and be like, Barack, just take me away. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that time you were thinking shitty things about Putin. <laughs> so two of our sponsors this week offer you the opportunity to make your holiday shopping easier this year. The first one is Crate Joy. You probably know what a subscription box is. In fact, you probably already have a favorite meal kit or a pet box. But did you know there's one great place where you can shop thousands of subscriptions no matter your interest? Well, there is. Welcome to CrateJoy. CrateJoy is the world's first and only subscription box marketplace. This is such a great idea. You can shop over thousands of unique boxes and gifts for just about anything you can imagine. 
CreateJoy makes it easy to find that perfect gift for anyone and everyone in your life. The hardest part of buying gifts is getting something cool and unique for somebody. CreateJoy does all that for you. What I love about subscription boxes is you're getting some fun surprises every month. To me, it's like experiencing Christmas every month. And CreateJoy has boxes themed around everything under the sun. You'll find escape rooms and mystery boxes for adventures at home. Boxes to boost each version of you with self-care and personal growth. Cool cocktail kits and snacks for your next virtual happy hour. And even monthly book clubs in a box for every reader. Best of all, you will find reviews from customers like yourself so you can see what others think before you sign up. And of course, we've got a special offer for millennial listeners. Get 30% off your first box when you sign up at CrateJoy.com slash M-I-L-L. That's right. Sign up today at CrateJoy.com slash M-I-L-L to get 30% off your first box and early access to all of CrateJoy's holiday specials. CrateJoy, get joy delivered right to your door. Okay, it's time for some feedback. Um, So this is from Jenna from Australia writing in about our post-election coverage last week. Jenna says, your coverage was great as always, but one thing that bothered me was the Trump supporter dialogue. Look, I get it. How can they possibly vote for him? They clearly have no empathy, selfish assholes, etc. I love the etc. For me, this really exemplifies one of the things that bothers me about America, the division. Both sides call the other side's names, snowflakes, lefty trolls, etc. Is this really helping the almost half of the population who are Trump supporters? People shout at each other online, spreading their own version of the truth, ignoring what the other has to say, quickly turning to name calling, neither trying to understand the opposition's point of view. It honestly reminds me of my brothers fighting when they were children, both being stupid, shouting at each other, just determined to win the argument, not for a second considering what the other was saying. I know that you try to be fair and just a lot of the time discussing the nuances of various issues. You had that Republican listener on once, which was fantastic. I know that you're all kind people wanting all Americans to succeed and be happy. I don't have a solution to the major divide between people worldwide, not just in America, who strongly disagree with one another. In Biden's speech, I was in tears. He said, we need to stop being hateful. How? I wish I knew. Anyway, I love you all, and I congratulate you on a well-deserved victory. I adore Biden and Harris. Honestly, I don't see any way past it for as long as there's so much misinformation out there and for as long as social media exists. We're always going to be in these bubbles where we're getting the information that we want to hear, left or right, and everybody's just always so hateful on social media. Not everybody, but large portions of people on social media will be hateful. And then we have these bot problems and they're stoking the flames. I really feel helpless in this regard. I really think it's going to take a long, long time before we get back to a, a better place in politics. I understand how from the outside looking in, it can seem this way. But The reason that I will never be able to find common ground with Trump supporters is, (laughs) and sorry, I'm doing exactly what you're asking us not to do. Donald Trump and his followers, they're not Republicans, right? Like, it's not about Republican versus Democrat. This election was about common decency and people's rights to live freely and with dignity and Donald Trump represents an ideology saying that people who aren't straight, white, and rich shouldn't get to do that. It was a point of view. It was an ideology that was actively hurting people. And that's never going to be anything that I can, like, meet somebody halfway on. You know, like kids in cages, (laughs) I can't meet somebody halfway on that, Um, you know, disenfranchisement of people through the stripping of the social safety nets that exist in this country. I can't meet somebody halfway on that. Um, I think that there was a time where you could have political differences with somebody and it could genuinely be disagreements about things like tax law. (laughs) Or like, 
you know, whether you were for or against certain local school board policies, right? But that's not what it is anymore. Unfortunately, politics has been turned into one half of the country actively looking to support a candidate that would strip the rights of people who aren't like them. And I think that's another part of the reason why it's gotten this bad. Social media has definitely not helped. But I really think that If the Republicans had nominated, say, John Kasich in 2016, if he had been their nominee uh, and he had won over Hillary Clinton, I wouldn't have been happy about it. I would have disagreed with the Kasich administration vigorously, like on everything. But I wouldn't have been afraid that the leader of the free world was actively trying to kill people. Um, I wouldn't have had concerns about the leader of the free world putting us in a dangerous situation from a foreign policy perspective. I wouldn't have been afraid that the leader of the free world was selling us down the river to Moscow, right? So it's just, we're in such a, a different position now than we used to be. It's not... It's not the the days of John McCain as the face of the Republican Party. Those days are so far behind us. And I don't know how we fix that. I don't know how the Republican Party fixes that. I really don't. Well, now they're playing into Trumpism. You know, they don't want to let it go. And we're just going to be seeing more and more of this. And another thing that makes me sick is that Joe Biden will probably govern from the center. But no, no matter how center he actually is... Fox News and these other networks are going to be spinning it like he's the most evil thing to ever come along in the White House. So there's just no winning here. Yeah, I think that, you know, obviously this show, um, we do, I think we do a really good job of voicing our opinions. And like, I appreciate that this person thinks that we try and remain balanced. But I think that maybe what we don't get into too much, because it's hard to to go in depth with this, such a short amount of time is the conversations that we have outside of this show in real life with people that maybe disagree with our viewpoints on politics. Um, I'm not disowning family members or, you know, I, it's not like I'm cutting people out of my life, but I think that, you know, my issue with this kind of like Laura is that it's really hard to um, try and have a, a, a civilized conversation with like my right leaning family members and then bring up something like a human rights issue, whether that be, you know, black lives matter or trans rights or gay rights, and then have them say, you know what, like that, somebody's life and, you know, their ability to lead a happy life with the same amount of rights that I am afforded um, is not as important as say, you know, making sure I get to keep my gun rights or making sure that like my tax bracket stays safe. It's really hard to stomach that. Mm-hmm. And obviously, like I'm I don't want to generalize everybody. I'm sure that like, you know, maybe somebody out there does have a different point of view. And and I don't think that we're trying to villainize anybody, but I just think that it's hard to get around that because it's just like it, it should be human common human decency to care for somebody else. And their ability to to lead, you know, a happy life. Um, that's something that's like in the Constitution, right? We, we are all supposed to be created equal and we're all supposed to be able to, um, you know, um, to have life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And it just really sucks that there are so many uh, minority groups in this country that are not afforded that just because of who they are. Amen. So I think that there's just like, so much nuance there. And I, I'm sure that social media amplifies that, but I hope that like from the outside looking in, most people understand that a lot of times when, you know, maybe somebody that like people like us that were, you know, on the, we're more left-leaning, more liberal-leaning. It's not like we're just feeding into what social media is telling us. This is just like, you know, there's stuff that happens outside of social media, the stuff that happens outside of this show that influences our opinions. And, um, and that's, a lot of the reasons why I know that the like I take the stances that I take on this show. So yeah, same. Yeah, well and said. also wanted to say you you mentioned our um, Republican guest that was Parker. We love Parker. Oh yeah, yeah he's just, great. Yeah, just yeah. wanted to plug that. And he's 
he's been on um, a few times, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah at I least more than once. Yeah, yeah, yeah at least yeah. at least a couple times. But yeah, like that's that's honestly the version of republicanism I would very much like to get back to. <laughs> the version yeah. where like I can disagree with you on an extreme level, but not feel as though you're actively like backing policies that would murder the people I love. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. It's a civilized discussion. And, and I really appreciate that, that, um, you know, he's come on the show and, and engaged in that with us, because I think that's probably more reflective of how we approach these situations in our real lives, or at least how we try to obviously like, at some point, if you're talking to a brick wall, you can't get through to somebody. But mm -hmm. I know that that I I try not to. Um, I try to listen when people explain to me why they disagree, and I feel like you guys do the same. I think Pam, you just articulated something else that's a challenge here. I have tried talking to Trump supporters. I really have, and it's like that brick wall <laughs> description Pam just gave because. I don't know how to fill the Grand Canyon sized chasm that exists between us in that I don't know how to explain to them why they should care about other people. Right. And when there's that much of a disconnect, like it's so hard. Okay. So we are going to share. Sorry. There's no <laughs> I don't know. way to transition. <laughs> no, there's not. There's not. <laughs> Yeah. Well, here's a positive note to think about for a second. We do have good vaccine news again for a second Monday in a row. But first, our final sponsor today is one who sponsored the show this time last year, Love Book. We here on the panel, all three of us have all made a Love Book and we are obsessed. Love Book lets you completely personalize a physical book for the special person or people in your life. Most customers use a love book to revisit their fondest memories or to list the reasons why they love someone. Love books are completely customizable, though, and people can use them however they like. Users create characters that look just like themselves and the recipient with all the features that make them unique. You get to pick the clothes, the hair, the skin tone, everything. And seriously, you can customize every little part of the book. You start with a template. Then go through each page and make your characters and the narrator say whatever you want. Add and remove pages to make the love book uniquely yours. This is a wonderful gift because you will floor whoever you're making it for. And even if you've made a love book before, I actually recommend taking a second look because they have all kinds of book ideas, including games. Love books are the perfect gift for any occasion, but especially for anniversaries, birthdays, and Christmas. Visit lovebookonline.com slash M-I-L-L to receive a special 20% discount only for our listeners. Again, that's lovebookonline.com slash M-I-L-L. The person you're making it for is going to be blown away by the book. I made Pat cry last year when I made one Aww. of these. But you don't even have to give it to like a, to a partner. You can give it to a parent, a grandparent, you know, a friend, anybody you want to show appreciation for. They will just be blown away by this because it's a physical book that's completely customized. It's just I geek out just over the technology. Like I'm so impressed by how they did this. So again, check it out. Lovebookonline.com slash M-I-L-L and you will receive 20% off your book. And these are not very expensive either. So I think you're going to be really happy with this, as will the recipient. Okay, time for the Rona roundup. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to play the Rona sound effect. It's just happy music <laughs> from here on out. Good vaccine update. Moderna, I guess that's how you pronounce it. They've been working on a vaccine. They say their vaccine is 94.5% effective. Wow, that's better than the Pfizer one. I believe it's around 90% effective. So this is very good news. Vaccines could be available on a limited basis by the end of the year. So of course, not everybody is going to get them by next month. But the people who need them most might. And uh, I think we also heard Fauci this week say that vaccines could be largely available by April, Laura. Do you believe I it? I freaking hope so. He was actually on CNN and um, your 
one of your favorite CNN stallions, Jake Tapper, was really pressing him to find out when he could get the vaccine specifically. He was, oh, my God. He was, like, Gr- he was like, I mean, I'm not an essential worker. So when can me and my family get the vaccine? That's amazing. Oh, Tapper will get one early. I'm sure CNN will be able to get yeah, vaccines but early. Fauci was like, he was kind of explaining sort of like the um, progression of like, how immunologists decide who's top priority and then the the various like rungs that people fall into. Um, and he said for the general public, he thought April sounded like a feasible uh, expectation, but also that, you know, that's obviously not set in stone yet. Um, but he also went on to say that he thought that we could be getting back to normal between June and July of next year. And, I I don't want to get my hopes up because this whole thing has just been so shitty and awful that I don't want to be disappointed if it ends up taking longer than that. I've been putting myself in a in a headspace of assuming that it's going to take all of 2021 for us to really get back to normal. Um but I will be so pleasantly surprised if it's actually April. Yeah. <laughs> I think it won't be until 2022 when we truly return to normal. I do feel like we're rounding the corner. I do feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. What? Why would you roll, no, roll I'm just, your eyes, it's, Laura? It's like it wasn't rolling my eyes at the statement. It's just like a moment. Oh, it's, it's like, like exasperation. I can't believe like, it. oh my God, like I can't believe yeah. we could finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, whenever this ends whether it's summer 2021 or 2022 people are going to lose their fucking minds like (laughs) it's gonna be orgies in the street we just think about so true (laughs) orgies in the street well you just think about big social gatherings being able to do those again like concerts and other events that happen where you live it'll just be very exciting to be shoulder to shoulder with people again and not feel afraid yeah anymore. the other day i grazed my barista's hand and it felt so forbidden <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> how could you i was not wearing gloves he was not wearing gloves it's a classic pandemic love story clearly <laughs> <Me too. laughs> oh beautiful i gave him coronavirus make him a love book <laughs> that's the most human contact i've had since you know march so <laughs> We'll we'll have to readjust. I mean, we've gotten so used to avoiding people and not shaking hands and stuff like that, that it's actually, I think it'll take some time to be like, oh, I can get close to you again. I don't have to be six feet away from you. It's going to be very You know, bizarre. Dr. Fauci said at the beginning of this that he actually hoped that this would create some cultural changes in terms of how much physical contact we have with people. Um, he was saying that he hoped we never went back to handshaking. Yeah, we spoke about that on the show a while ago. Yeah. I agree. We should we should not. Let's do a bow. Let's do a wave. Let's do an air five. It is kind of crazy because like uh, in America, obviously, we we shake hands and that's basically it for for people that you don't know very well. But like, for example, my family is Hispanic and there's much more affection that's shown in those cultures. There's a lot of like... Um, cheek kissing even if it's like a casual acquaintance or hugging Mm -hmm. and um i you know obviously have not had much contact with my family this year in an effort to keep my grandparents safe but i do kind of wonder if um those countries the countries like that or even countries in europe are are struggling a little bit more than than what we might be here in the states because that that's a huge cultural difference to unlearn. Right. The tiny cat who is listening live right now says, so kissing all my friends for Christmas gifts 2021. <laughs> I know everyone's just going to make out with their friends after this is over. <laughs> I got my flu shot over the weekend. I'm set. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, before we wrap the show, um, with some recommendations, we just wanted to say most importantly of all that this week's episode was sponsored by listeners like you. It means so much to us here at Millennial to have your support because it allows us to make time for this show that we love week to week. And if you're interested in supporting the show, there's tons of great bonus content available exclusively at patreon.com slash millennial. We're talking our flagship benefit after dark, the millennial variety show, our discord where you can chat with us and your fellow patrons access to our live recording studio every week, and so much more. 
And even if you're not in a place to part with your hard-earned dollars, you can still support the show by subscribing to us for free on your favorite podcasting app and leaving a review. We know it's been a rough year and we are so appreciative for your support, financial or otherwise. Yeah, thank you very much. And we love putting together gifts like this shirt, like I mentioned. And also we have After Dark. What is coming up in After Dark today? So we actually received a confessional from one of our patrons related to last week's holiday discussion about, you know, telling your family you're not coming home for Christmas. So we'll dive into that. But Pam and I have also had a couple of experiences in our lives that make us wonder, are we prepared for another potential lockdown? And it's been suggested by a number of health officials. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how we think we might be better prepared this time than we were uh, earlier in the year, even though that feels like 10,000 years ago. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about some of the the stock that I've already noticed missing from grocery stores. <laughs> I have too. I'm glad you have a note about that. Yeah. I'm surprised. What happened? We had it together for so long. I know. So I'm long. like, why are we doing this again, guys? <laughs> Stop panic buying. Okay. So that's at patreon.com slash millennial. It's time for recommendations. You may not realize that a lot of your personal information actually gets posted online by data brokers. Like your your freaking physical address, your phone number, email addresses, all kinds of things, your family relationships, it's all out there if you start Googling. There is a service that will actually monitor your personal information online for you, and then they go out and work to get it deleted from places like whitepages.com and all these other sites that buy information from data brokers and then republishes them. So I signed up for Delete Me, and I really like it. It's $10 a month. It's just peace of mind for me that somebody is keeping an eye on my personal information online, making sure it's not out there. They will do the Google searches and they will go to these sites and be like, hey, take it down. And they have to take down this information if they get a request to. But you don't want to do that because there's like 5 billion websites that that share your information. So I like Delete Me. $10 a month. There's also an annual subscription. Again, this is peace of mind for me because I don't like knowing that my personal information is out there. All right. Well, this is kind of predictable for me, but I'm recommending The Crown Season 4. I had this recommendation in the doc before we actually talked about it on the show. I'll forgive you. Yeah. I didn't cheat. This is Biden's Um, America. It's a whole different world. Right. Exactly. In Biden's America, we can cheat on the recommendations. Um, (laughs) I, you know none of at least none of, nobody on this panel is really old enough to remember Margaret Thatcher um you know as prime minister um but i've certainly seen footage of her um and i've learned about her and Gillian Anderson's portrayal is like chilling like i heard her voice and i was like ugh like a shiver ran up my spine. It was really good. Um, but also, I I feel bad. The name of the actor who's portraying Princess Diana, is it Corinne something or Emma something? Yeah. She is phenomenal. Now, I will say of this period, we are all, all old enough to remember Princess Diana and her tragic death. And I just... I remember the sound of her voice very distinctly. And the first time I heard this actor talking, I got chills. I was just like, wow, she nailed it. Um, So there's just a lot of good stuff going on. Of course, um, you know, the rest of the cast is just phenomenal, as, as always. So definitely check it out. Netflix. All the episodes have dropped. So, you know, if you like to binge like me or unlike Andrew, this will be good. And I wanted to recommend investing in a coffee mug warmer. Anyone you would prefer to invest in would probably work just fine. Um, I love these things year round. I'll use it because I'm a pretty slow coffee drinker, but especially in the winter when my coffee tends to cool faster and it's just getting chillier outside. It's just nice to, um, to have around the house because you can put your coffee cup on there and it stays a good temperature while yeah. you're sipping on that and working. Um, I think I have the Mr. Coffee one and it's like 11 bucks on Amazon. So if you're looking for a nice little way to treat yourself, I would suggest picking up one of those and you can heat anything on there like hot chocolate, um, tea, all that stuff stays warm. So it's really I, nice. 
Yeah, that's a great rec because like you said, this time of year, your drinks get cooler faster. So you need one of these if you're, if you're sitting at a desk for a while. I actually, uh, last year I received for Christmas one of these smart mugs that syncs with your phone. And I thought it was a great idea. It's called Ember and the reviews were fine. But oh my God, this mug was the biggest pain in the ass. I would have to load up the app every day and get it to heat to the temperature that it was supposed to automatically heat to once it detected liquid in it. Some things are just not meant to be turned into smart devices and a coffee mug is one of them. So I went back to a good old fashioned mug warmer. It never lets me down. (laughs) And I have the same one, Pam, this $11 Mr. Coffee. I just, I honestly do want to upgrade so to speak that one that automatically switches off because sometimes i accidentally leave it on and then you know it's burning for like 20 hours which makes me uncomfortable. yeah yeah that's the only downside like there are fancier ones or or like i think that brookstone has one that i had before and it it has like a high low temperature so you can get like super crazy with them but but the mr coffee one is nice if you just want to try it out um it keeps the coffee comfortably warm i don't wouldn't say it's like too hot Mm -hmm. so that's also nice if you like your drinks a little bit cooler okay well if you have anything to say about what we have said on today's episode you can email millennialshow at gmail.com or use the contact form on millennialshow.com don't forget we also have the confessional on the website also follow us on social media we are millennial show on instagram twitter and facebook Thank you, everybody, for listening to today's episode. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.